The Dark Side of Early Access Gaming. Let's go. This is Chris Roberts. He was the creative mind behind the wildly popular Wing Commander franchise that first took flight in 1990. I remember playing this game with my dad when I was a kid. Moving in. Bro, this is old. It was an amazing Holy. game for its time. The franchise was a huge success. They even got Mark Hamill to star in the game. Oh, shit. I hope you're right, Admiral. I hope we are on the same side. Was this like after Star Spoiler Wars? Spoiler alert, they're not. Today, Chris Roberts is working on a new ambitious game called Star Citizen. He started accepting funding for the game after about a year of development, but that was back in- Bro, isn't this that one game that's been in development for like years? Like numerous, like five to 10 years or something like that? <laughs> or, or was it like 15 or 20? I'm not sure. In 2012, more than oh. 10 years ago. Okay. And after raising over $500 million and numerous failed attempts to adhere to a schedule, the developers have made a decision to not publicly discuss any official release timelines. Lately, bro, what a joke of a game developer. That shit is so chalked. You you made half a billion dollars and you didn't even deliver a product. Wow. I've become so frustrated with the gaming industry that I hired an Unreal Engine developer to help me create a fake game trailer. I wanted to test how easy it is to convince people that a project is real. I wanted to be in the trailer, so I had to shave my beard and wear a disguise to hide my identity. Can I, oh can my I, can I get my beard back? And it so worked. Smooth. You all ate it up. And I'm going to explain why I did it, how I did it, and where we go from here. But before we jump into that, if you weren't aware, last month my PC was taken down by a hacker after my video brought attention to the cheating problem in Escape from Tarkov. Yep. Turns out criminal organizations uh, get mad when their uh, servers are raided by the police. The hackers were able to identify who I was. Bitches. And target me. But I have since thought about my security on the internet. And if I had been using a VPN from Private Internet Access, the sponsor of today's video, I would have never been targeted in the first place. You all know how I... Or if you didn't make the video, you wouldn't have been targeted in the first place there. <laughs> that too. A VPN can allow you to access geo-blocked content. But something that most people don't realize is that when you connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot, all of your internet traffic is visible regardless of if you are in an incognito mode. Ooh. Hmm. True. I've always shied away from using a VPN because I don't want it to lower my ping when I am gaming. And it turns out that in many cases, your ISP is routing your connection through a congested or inefficient pathway to reach the gaming server. A VPN can potentially bypass that and connect you to a gaming service via a more direct and efficient path. In my testing, I had about a four to five millisecond faster ping on average when I was connecting to Colombian Tarkov servers using a Colombian VPN servers through private internet access. That's the key, man. Four to five milliseconds, bro, I'll be awesome. That's the main thing that was holding me back the whole time. That four to five milliseconds, if I can shave that off, I'm, I'm, I'm goaded. I'm fine. And it's not just about the ping. A VPN encrypts all internet communications coming from your device, making your personal data unreadable by third parties. Many of you have asked how you can support me, and I would appreciate it if you would head over to piavpn.com slash go to start using a VPN for 83% off. It wasn't cheap to hire a game developer to help me with this project, and sponsors like Private Internet Access allow me to make videos like this. For only $2.03 a month, you can protect yourself today. More information in the description box. When I was a kid, I bought physical copies of games or rented them at Blockbuster. True. Dude, I remember so many times going into Blockbuster. Uh, and one of my favorite games to constantly rent in there was the one time I played Sims. It was like the Playboy version of Sims. And I think... I rented it like three times in a row because <laughs> I think it was like you can rent it for a week or whatever and then you'd have to bring it back but then you could just re-rent it again yeah <laughs> welcome to Blockbuster Video Rest in peace, Blockbuster. Yep. There wasn't going to be another update or version to look forward to until they release a follow-up title. And did they ever deliver? And whatever bugs existed on these little memory sticks became part of the game. And in some cases, the bugs lived on to become part of the franchise forever. Do you remember mm -hmm. Warthog jumping in the original Halo? Yep. Bro, Warthog jumping and the sword cancel jumping. So for the sword cancel jumping, it was like 
you have to put yourself in a corner. You can kind of do it like against a wall, but you need like another like person. Um, so you get in a corner and then you have, you crouch and look down or whatever. Someone jumps up on top of you and then you jump, they stand up and then the bottom person has a sword. And I think this was in Halo two. Um, the person jumps up and you, I think you spammed your weapon. Like you hit the, the like the fire button and then you switch or whatever, or it was something like that. But then what you ended up doing was because the sword did a lunge, whenever that person jumped, you go up, they jump, you lunge up, jump, lunge up, jump, lunge up. And you could do that and like essentially just get out of the level. <laughs> and here's where it gets interesting. The developers did not remove Warthog jumping in future releases of the game, and it still remains in Halo's Combat Evolved Anniversary Edition, still playable almost 20 years later. Recently, love physics. Nintendo revealed a new flying raft in a trailer for the upcoming game, Tears of the Kingdom, which is slated for release in a few weeks. The addition of this flying structure to the game has sparked speculation among fans, and some believe oh. it was inspired by a popular Breath of the Wild flying guardian glitch. And there we go. We have takeoff. It's easier said than done to get this right. 90s kids will remember the missing number glitch Pokemon, which could be- Bro, I remember doing this so much. And it's like, it had something to do with like getting a bunch of uh, rare candies. But at the time, I didn't realize that if you leveled a Pokemon with rare candies, it would be weaker than a similar level Pokemon it just leveled up fighting monsters because the EV IV numbers will be way greater if you just like, you know, fought to like level 100 versus doing the, the rare candy thing. But you know, when I first did, I was like, oh my God, I got level 100, like Alakazam or whatever. Be replicated under certain conditions. This glitch became quite popular and some fans even created their own custom Pokemon card oh my God. as a novelty item. IGN listed the bug as one of the top 10 best Easter eggs in gaming history. Oh Catching yeah. It also ended up giving you an infinite number of whatever items you had in your six item slot. Very handy for rare items like master balls or rare candy. Yep. I can't really express to the younger audience how different it was encountering glitch in older video games. It was like discovering a hidden gem. And today you won't see anyone reference bugs in games as Easter eggs. It's just an expectation that you'll run into game errors. I threw up a quick poll in my discord and the majority of players have never even filled out a bug report. And it's not because oh, they yeah. aren't experienced bugs i think it's because beta testing a game these days just means you accept the fact that the game is unfinished and broken as time went by the internet expedited the delivery of games to the consumer to the point where almost all games today are downloaded over the internet developers mm -hmm. now have the ability to release patches and updates on the fly especially for multiplayer games and today it has become increasingly common for games to be released in beta status unfinished and unlike the past bugs are introduced in new patches and well yeah because it's way easier to deliver a half product with the promise of it's going to get better. It's a live service game. You know, we'll fix it later, guys. Just give us money now. And as long as we tell you it's early access, you know, there's no expectation of it, you know? So if the game sucks, you know, it's not necessarily on us because it's in this, you know, unfinished phase content releases. The developer isn't testing anything at all in most cases. They have an unfinished product that needs more funding and attention. Attention so they can get more funding, more funding so they can push new content in a new patch so they can get more attention. Yep. More attention so they can get more funding. And it's a cycle. More funding so they get more attention. It's, it's a circular loop. And part of the circular loop is to get attention and of course more funding. Oh my God, it just pulls you in, yep. doesn't it? Part of getting more attention is releasing gameplay or cinematic trailers that do what is called vertical slicing. Game developers sometimes work on a small portion of a game to show off how gameplay will work before getting the green light to develop the rest of the game. The same concept as a pilot episode in television. Pilot yeah. episodes serve the same function as a vertical slice. However, they're often included in the official release of the series if it gets picked up. But this technique has been corrupted and gotten so out of control that some indie game devs put together a vertical slice of a game that is essentially theater. Nothing works. It's all movie magic. The world of the day before is teeming with hungry hordes of bloodthirsty infected. What is Unlike this? Unlike a TV series where what you see is what you get, you actually interact and play a video game. A vertical slice should be a working version of a game. This isn't Redfall, But I'm watching someone else play. It would be very easy for them to hide problems with the game. And to get a better understanding of how easy it is to do this, I did it myself. 
This is Crimson. He's a game developer and streamer. Go check him out on Twitch. He's a really cool guy. And I sent him this storyboard. And this is how TVs, movies, and commercials are thought out. Directors and writers storyboard their ideas and then send it off to a producer to figure out how they're going to make everything happen. And the cinematographer, design team, and talent put together a plan and create a schedule, oh my God. budget, etc. In this two-person- Everything's a lie. <laughs> Nothing is real. Everything is fake. The studio made up of Crimson and I I made up a scene to show off an open world loot extraction game I named Plaguelands. And here are some of the scenes from the trailer. Oh, what is that? Beat Street Studio. This is the fake game. Okay, we can uh, stop it right there. You can find a full video and a link in my description box, but it's not real at all. Look at what happens when we look around a bit too much. The city floats. Yeah. Nothing is interactable in this trailer. We had to hide any interaction with objects because it takes way too much time uh, to actually make things work in a game. The character didn't actually fuel up. Uh, you just heard it happening. And the character didn't get out of a vehicle because animating that would be annoying. Yeah. To make the whole thing more believable, I introduced some of the developers working on the project. Bro, look at this wig. <laughs> look at this. <laughs> oh my God. That wig is just too funny. <laughs> Project. Creative director? That's my buddy Andy. Uh, he doesn't even play video games. He's a musician and mixes music for a living. And the network programmer? That's David. He's an awesome dude, but he doesn't know anything about game development. About server coding. And the lead developer? The inspiration for this project was when I watched a trailer for a similar type of game called The Day Before. The game rocketed to the number one spot on the Steam wishlist charts after they released what we now know was a fake game trailer. Oh my but God. On the Day Before has not yet admitted to being fake, but it's been widely covered and the evidence is overwhelming at this point that this game will never be made in the way that it was represented in the trailers. And eventually we have arrived at a point where if an ambitious project is released, it's gonna be in beta format, incomplete, and the player base expects to test the game while the developers apply hot fixes and add content over time mm -hmm. for those of us who played new world if you didn't hear about this game it oh was boy by this uh, small indie game studio uh so i'd never played new world i wanted to but like a regular person i didn't play it on day one even though that's like the most fun time to you know get into a game and play it i waited a week or so and you know wanted to hear what everybody else thought about it you know, plus it's an MMO. MMOs on day one are the actual worst, like, thing to, you know, ever drop. It's never perfect. And besides that, I don't know, it was just bad. So, about a week or so after New World came out, everyone was like, there was too many bugs with it. So, I'm just like, I'm not wasting my time with this. I'll just, like, watch some people play it or whatever called Amazon. And for every new patch that fixed the problem, players experienced at least one new game breaking bug to the point where sometimes they would have to roll the servers back due to the harm it created. Amazon rolls back New World servers after giving out too much free gold. Oh my God. You wanna talk about inflation? <laughs> Which is absolutely terrible for an MMO. In order to combat the gold duplication via lagging exploit, the game now does not process transactions when one of the players involved is seen as lagging or being offline. This works fine to stop the exploit for now, but has wider reaching implications. It is important to note, these knee-jerk reaction hotfixes are being added directly to the live game, because at this point, New World does not have a public test realm or test server. So nothing is Oof. being tested before it goes live. I could easily Oof. make an entire video about just New Josh. World game breaking bugs, which Josh Strife Hayes did. 
You could easily crash other players' clients by simply typing in the text in your chat box. There what? was an almost infinite damage glitch with the hatchet for a good while, and during my entire time playing this game, the lag was so bad in wars, everyone would just be frozen on objectives for like 20 minutes. So here's the thing. Oh my Donald god. Early access games are a complete mess. Take Minecraft, for example. It was first released as a free early access game back in 2009, but since then it has become one of the most successful games ever made. Oh yeah. The difference between Minecraft and other early access games like Star Citizen lies in the development development process. Meditated wham. Minecraft initially accepted pre-orders in 2009, but as the creator of Minecraft, Notch himself, stated back in 2010, they didn't need much investment to complete the game. Yeah, uh, being able to be self-funded is uh, the biggest like advantage. Um, a, a lot of people wanted to invest, but we didn't really need it, which mm -hmm. was it's great because now we just own ourselves. This yes. funding allowed them to release the game in 2011, just a few years later. And as you know, the game's success continued to grow, eventually leading to Microsoft's acquisition of the company in 2014. Point Early access Ooh, games yeah. can work, but why do they often fail? So let's take a moment to compare two wildly different space themed good projects. Question. On one hand, we have SpaceX, an innovative rocket company that was able to design- Oh my God, look at Elon. He's all like hunched over trying to explain this shit. <laughs> oh my God build and launch a Falcon 1 rocket into orbit in just six years, all with a budget of $100 million. And on the other hand, we have Star Citizen, a game about pretend rockets in space that has been in development for 13 years and has a budget that's more than five times that of SpaceX. I'm just going to take a shot in the dark. And I'm going to say one of the, or at least one of the reasons early access games don't really work is most likely because there's precedence for early access games not working. Now, granted, there are probably some outliers, which are the exception to the rule, but early access games don't work because too many early access games in the past have fall, fallen like flat on their face. So if your chances of that happening are gonna be like that, then like, why would I take the risk and just give somebody my money? I mean, you know, you really have to tug at someone's like heartstrings for them to like donate or, or whatever. And you might say that comparison is not fair. I know revolutionizing the space rocket industry with only hundred million dollars is much more difficult. And there isn't a game company out there that has an Elon Musk. However, Bethesda Game Studios has the Todd father. The to this is Todd <laughs> Howard. He's the video game director and designer at Bethesda Game Studios. You've most likely played one of his games like Skyrim or Fallout. Yep. In a recent interview with Lex Freeman, Todd talks about his process creating Starfield, their upcoming open world space game. And unlike the unreleased Squadron 42, which is the single player component of Star Citizen, Starfield is coming this year. In the interview, Todd says oh, he's been wanting to make Starfield for as long as he can remember, but he had to wait for the right time. The seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremie pipe <laughs> to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the gram meter. Because technology, <laughs> am I right? The ability to time the launch of an ambitious space game was a skill that Chris Roberts did not have. Todd didn't just jump into making the game regardless of what was possible at the time. The first thing Todd and his team did was figure out how they could accomplish the most ambitious part of the entire project. Well, the first thing we did it was, how are we gonna render a planet, like pull it off for the player? Like, can we? Mm -hmm. Or do we have to sort of do it where you can't land on all of them, where you're landing in a very controlled, small, world space that we, you know, kind of craft and you would have a very limited set of those. They figured out how to procedurally generate and handle a thousand planets in their game. We started the game right after Fallout 4, so 2016. And the first Dang. thing we did, how can we have a system to generate these planets and make them look, well, I'll say reasonable, as reasonable. opposed to, you know, fractally goop. Came up with a way, um, had prototyped of of building tiles, like large tiles of landscape, the way we would usually build them. We kind of generate them offline, hand do some things, and end up with these very realistic looking tiles of landscape. These actually look and decent. And then built a system that wraps those around a planet. But unfortunately, what ends up happening with a lot of these like big tiles and planets is like, they're very interesting to look at, but what's the reason for me to go there as a player, you know, that's where the the juice comes from, the magic, you know, like, why would I want to go to this crater besides seeing it? What's there for me to do there? You know, because if 
you have nothing to do there, then you got a big bowl of empty. And blends them all together. And we had pretty successful results with that. So we thought, yeah, we could we could do this. Before jumping feet first in designing Starbases and selling virtual ships, they wanted to see if they could do the hardest part of the game development first and then work backwards from there. And even more importantly, Ta talks about why there are so many planets. What would you even do with all of them? There was yeah. a big design kind of... It's like they made a new piece of technology over at Bethesda. They're like, oh, wow, we can generate planets. And essentially... You know, you're just generating worlds. And, you know, it, this isn't just for Starfield. You know, what if they just generated one planet, then just decided to make a game on that planet, taking out all the space stuff for it, and just made a game on that planet, you know? I think that would be really cool. You know? But, you know, you, you then you have to come up with a story, gameplay, all this stuff. You know, what kind of game is it going to be? Like, action adventure, FPS, RPG you know, whatever, you know, all these things. Problem to solve in terms of, well, what's fun about landing on a planet where there's potentially nothing um, except resources. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, let's just lean in on that can A, be a lonely experience. Yeah. As long as we tell the player, here's what's there. Here are the resources that are there. Go find them. And I do think there's a certain beauty to landing on a strange planet being somewhat the only person there building an outpost and we are modeling all of the systems because that's how we like to do things so you can watch whatever that gas giant or moon it will rotate and go and sunrise sunset and all of those things that you would expect and it's it's all really happening again he's a master game designer and director he's thinking of all these things far in advance and i'm sure there are ideas and concepts that he wanted to attempt that they mm -hmm. had to shelve and while unfortunate, it's a good thing to find early in the process what can and can't be done. But there's one thing that Star Citizen is clearly doing better than Starfield. After doing a lot of research, I've come to the conclusion that Star Citizen's crowdfunding is a master class in how to raise money for a project. I just wish I could say the same thing. What is all this? Like, Hornet? What is this? Hornet 7, uh, F7C starter pack? I guess it's just a ship? For 125 bucks, you can buy a ship. Freelancer starter pack. In stock, in stock. This is so funny. 125 bucks. Pack. Constellation Andromeda Starter Package. Starter Pack? Starter Package. Uh, UEE Exploration 2950. In stock. Th Look at the price tags on this shit, dude. 1100 bucks? Oh my god. <laughs> like, with all these price tags... Bro, look how many games you could get for 1100 bucks. You could get like a souped up laptop for that, you know? Or you could get like a an okay computer for that. Or a ship. Oh my god. For their game development. They've pulled out every trick in the book, allowing backers to spend as little as $45 and as much as a hundred grand? What? And I started with the war pack. So that's an old pack. I don't think it's available anymore. It's, it was $5,100 at the time. I found an interview with a player who spent $100,000. People who throw this sort of money around are called whales. And this whale started yep. off with a war pack for a mere $5,100 back in 2017. I, I remember being in hangars and being like, this is not what I thought it was. And then looking into the refund policy and there's no refund policy. And then I was running a tech company at the time and I was like, well, but I got to go do work. So I'll and this well accepts. The tech. <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> Looks like I bought this digital item that has no real world value. As I get it, bet, you know, I guess I better go back to work. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, man. <laughs> Dang. And, you know, this guy, you know, whenever you buy, like, early access items, it's hard to tell. Like, one of the things is, like, is this person just trying to get an advantage on on the game when it comes out? Or do they just believe in the game so much and them donating the money is just, like, all these little items are just, like, a side effect of them just legitimately wanting to give them money, you know? Versus, like, I just want to get an advantage, you know, in whatever. I don't know. 
that giving money to a game company is akin to gambling in Vegas. The way I look at it, 100,000 is not a significant amount of money if you consider Vegas. So I'm not a big gambler, I don't like gambling, but I have other members of my family uh, who do enjoy that kind of stuff and oh have boy. gone to Vegas and spent, you know, $25,000 on one hand of blackjack or so. And for me, it's video games and spaceships. Star Citizen even lets you purchase the individual ships, which can cost as much as $3,600. I must admit that these ships are really neat, and much to my surprise, the Javelin sold out in five minutes, but they haven't kept people from spending money on it. For example, you could get the Javelin with this Legatus pack for $27,000. I even have a concierge service to handle these sort of transactions. I always tell myself I'm never going to spend another dollar. And uh, no, you all will. I have to do is release another spaceship, and I'll spend more. No, you I, will. I'm just too addicted to the idea of the game. This ship that we are looking at right now is called the Javelin, and a limited number of people bought these. The Jav. Hey man, you got the Jav? Yeah man, I got the Jav back in 2014 and 2015. If you had purchased them in the past, you would be the proud owner of one of these bad boys. Just look at this thing. It's got an infirmary and a place to launch smaller ships that your friends could bring along for the ride, but the ship isn't in the game yet. And even if it magically was in the game, staffing one of these ships would almost fill up the entire server's capacity. Two javelins fully staffed is more than the 120 player limit that a server can handle in one area. What? Star Citizen Bro, that's like, ain't it? You remember Dead Space 1? Like the entirety of Dead Space 1 was on a ship, the Ishimura, all right? You could probably play Dead Space in this ship all right <laughs> imagine that <laughs> this is an mmo in theory but in practice nobody in the game can actually experience large scale space battles and while star citizen backers will criticize the scope of todd howard's game starfield is an actual game with a release date that you'll be able to play you know in reality sometimes take a look at this timeline Maybe. of events that have taken place while star citizen has been in development while star citizen was in pre-production instagram launched windows 8 was released about the same time as their kickstarter oh and my Unreal god engine 4 and 5 both became part of game developers toolbox all while star citizen disabled their hangar module due to a bug all this happened while from software released six games including dark souls 1 through 3. oh yeah and uh elden ring and while a star citizen oh whale is God. still waiting for his javelin to be delivered that costs as much as a used Altima, he'll likely <laughs> FOMO into the latest and greatest ship Bye. after each update. It's basically a part of Star Citizen's business model at this point. It's an addiction. I, I, I'm just too addicted. And they even have a multi-level market it. scheme called their Creator Referral Program, which puts the community at work to sell more copies of the game. Star Citizen is on track to raise over $1 billion by 2025 if they keep pace with their current financial statements, which showed nearly $700 million in overall funding to date. And while this Star Citizen orca oh, in this interview is quite content with his support for the game... Bro, $700 million. Bro, with that amount of money, I could be a shark on Shark Tank, all right? I would be a force on Shark Tank, you know? What's kept me around, honestly, is the fact that it's in development. The bug hunting is fun to me. Not everyone would agree. There's a vibrant community of people who created a Star Citizen refund subreddit, encouraging players to try to get their money back and mostly just like... An imaginary game is forever good, but a launched game can be bad. What is launch anyway? <laughs> oh my god. That's so funny and true. Yeah. Because you never have to launch the game. You know? It's like, guys, look at this new thing we just made. It's going to be in the final version. It's like, oh yeah, man. Awesome. Five years later. Oh, guys, look what we've just made. This is awesome. It's going to be in the new game. Or in the final version of it. Oh, awesome, man. And you just keep people with that, you know, carrot on a stick type deal. You just keep releasing like cool things, but as long as it's an early access, it's fine. Bashing the game. Star Citizen did receive enough pressure to change some of their policies to prevent refunds from going through. One major difference between Jeez. crowdfunding a game versus finding investors is that backers often encourage. Bro, imagine if everybody just wanted their money back after a cut like the first couple years like five years goes by like bro just refund give me my money back you know you guys ain't making shit over there <laughs> imagine that purge what's called feature creep 
Backers don't get a financial return when a game is finished. In fact, the game is finished too early, they get less features per dollar. It's not like backers are having to pay a monthly subscription fee or pay for the operating costs like a true investor would. There's almost no reason individual backers would push back against new features being added to the game. Yeah. But they should. And this is where you get into this absurd situation where AI is... It seems like it's like a gradient or something, like a point of no return. Like they're trying to find the sweet spot or whatever of the developers always wanting to add more features and the payers are just like, yeah, bring them on, bring them on. But there has to be like a pushing point, like a stopping point where it's just like, yeah, more features. It's like, no, just release the game, you know, polish it up or whatever. There has to be like some sort of pushback frozen and broken everywhere in the game but the developers are proud to announce bedsheet deformation physics you know, what game but the developers are proud to announce bedsheet deformation because of course it is like what what do you mean bedsheet deformation that should just be like with all the like materials you know like clothing cloth all that shit should just be like in there like what did you just like put a bunch of those little like white balls on top of like a bed sheet and you just like mo capped a bed like people just pushing around a sheet and be like oh look at this guy who got bed sheet deformation look at this nice fluffy comforter just bleh. like what are you doing <laughs> this is in 2022 like look at this <laughs> what why would you be so proud if you paid like 50k for Star Citizen, and it's like, yeah, but does your game have bedsheet deformation? What? <laughs> physics, you know, for immersion. <laughs> Most backers are not whales, and they have a, a, a relatively small amount of money invested. They don't have anything on the line other than their expectations that will surely be crushed. Backers don't approach the situation like a real investor because the money they threw in is gone regardless of what happens. Yeah. For a thought experiment, imagine what would happen if Chris Roberts had to go on Shark Tank initially to secure funding. Yeah. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Oh my God. <laughs> Who is gonna be the lucky shark to invest in my game, Star Citizen? Did you work on a game before Star Citizen? Oh yes, I created the game Freelancer. Catch. What happened with that project? I ran out of money after four years and was bailed out by Microsoft and later left the project before it was completed. I have to call out the white elephant for me in the room. This looks just like Freelancer. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's okay there, buddy. And for those reasons, I'm out. <laughs> And while Chris can make false promises and avoid answering questions his backers ask him if he doesn't want to, when you are speaking to a real investor, the FTC will throw you in jail for fraud if you lie. And if they were to press him on why Freelancer was so expensive and delayed, he would likely respond the same way. It's not lying. It's just not yet delivered completely. Well, he always does. Nobody has ever tried to create a game with this magnitude and scope. And the investor's next question would be, is there perhaps a reason for that? But why yeah. is Cosmic Chris so addicted to adding features to the game? Because a pre-release game must keep everyone engaged and entertained while the game is being developed. If they add no new features until release, by the time the game comes out, it'll be old and boring. Mr. Roberts admits himself that this would be a problem back in 2012, when he said it would be ideal to only take three years to complete. We're already one year in. Another two years puts us at three total which is ideal. All right. One plus two is three. Good job, man. Any more and things will begin to get stale. Oof. He said it himself. Any more and things would begin to get stale. <laughs> oh man, that quote aged like milk left out in the sun. Adding features to encourage backers to keep playing and investing works to some extent, but it can become the nail in the coffin if the game already is behind schedule. Each new feature seemingly a small addition, but can cause major bugs, delays, and they start to stack up and cause all sorts of complexity and problems that can bring- Uh, guys, we gotta delay the game. The bedsheet deformation is off. <laughs>
a game to its knees. But Colonel Cosmos has decided to do the opposite. Recently, he has admitted numerous times that the game will probably never actually have a release date in Star Citizen and will continue to be worked on for the foreseeable future. And it's not like they have a somewhat advanced, stable game that they're holding the release back because they want to add new and amazing features. Star Citizen's AI and server stability is completely laughable right now. Yeah. The feature creep has halted progress on the game so much so that it's sort of a meme to try to do anything in the game before your ship blows up or you get disconnected or have some other game breaking bug that just. Bro, your ship can blow up? Is there some sort of like insurance policy for your ship? Bro, imagine paying like a couple thousand dollars for a ship and it just blows up. Like what? I'd be pissed, man. Destroys your experience. When feature creep combines with the sunk cost fallacy, the belief that we should continue investing in something simply because we've already invested so much. Disaster often follows. It's like yep. being on a spaceship that's taking on too much weight, but instead of dumping unnecessary cargo, the crew decides to keep it all because, you know, they've already spent so much fuel getting it on board. The result is a slow moving vessel that's more likely to crash and burn than to reach its destination. By the time Star Citizen releases, the technology that was once innovative will be ancient. AI yeah. will probably create more efficient development processes and competition could swoop in and create a better version before the project is even complete, making Star Citizen a true. Bro, imagine if AI made Star Citizen before Star Citizen made Star Citizen. How crazy would that be? true waste of resources. And that's happening right now with games like Starfield. If you're an average consumer new to this space and you're looking for a futuristic space game to play, my bet is that you'll choose Starfield over Star Citizen this year. Yeah. And while Star Citizen may continue to attract attention with its lofty promises and massive crowdfunding campaign, the inevitable delays and feature creep are likely to alienate more and more fans over time. Starfield will continue to offer DLCs and modding and opportunities to keep players engaged for years to come. And slowly, over time, Star Citizen could be cut off from their massive crowdfunding campaign. I'm not some vengeful gamer god sitting atop an ivory tower of investment wisdom yep. trying to destroy Star Citizen. In fact, I throw my money at all kinds of pre-release projects. I'm like a moth to a flame, but instead of a flame, it's a promise of a game that'll blow my socks off. And sometimes it does, but mostly I'm left barefoot and disappointed. Yeah. And that's the magic of crowdfunding. When the suits in the boardroom don't see the value in your vision, crowdfunding can bring together a community of passionate supporters who share your dream. Sure, the game you're backing might not end up being finished or it might not turn a profit if it even does release, but that's the beauty of crowdfunding model. It's a chance to take a risk, to explore uncharted territories and to boldly try what others have deemed impossible. But I have a few lessons I've learned that I'd like to share after playing early access games for the last like 20 years. Before you give money to a game, assess if you can get your value back with what is currently playable. This is the reason I've played Tarkov for so long and have yet to pull the trigger on Star Citizen. Despite hmm. the problems with Tarkov, I've played for thousands of hours and I've enjoyed it. Star Citizen is a tougher sell. Every time I ask people if the game is ready to be played, they all warn me it's still not really in a great place. I was going to pop my head in and see what's going on recently and players haven't been able to reliably log in and play for over a month at this point after the 3.18 patch but i'm uh -oh. open to having my mind change and let's be real starfield won't replace star citizen they are trying no. to do different things and there's enough space for both of them get it Thanks. And besides, <laughs> ai and technological advances might make long and expensive game development irrelevant over time and i'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket i've made that mistake before i won't be a cheerleader or a fanboy for any specific game developer ever again every yeah. time i get heavily involved in an early access game i almost feel like i'm part of the production and the future of the game yeah because once you invest so much money and your game like turns out being a flop it erodes your trust or the next time you do it for the next game developer and doing it over and over again you know it can erode your trust depending on you know that, you know like how willing are you to keep going and just you know like donating to like a game developer or something like that you know the downsides of getting involved with an early access game even after doing all of the research for this video I can't hardly resist checking out Star Citizen and wanting to write a blank check to Daddy Roberts. So what does this mean for me? And what about the future of gaming? It's truly incredible to be close to the action as a developer creates the most sophisticated and intricate video game ever made. Tarkov and Star Citizen are not just expensive games that take forever to develop. They are truly unique and special. Maybe one day AI will swoop in and help speed up game development. But until that day, I'm gonna to continue to check in on these projects. 
Hey there, buds. Uh, have an interesting story or a lead that I should investigate? Join the Discord and send me a tip. I'm open to more than just gaming related content. And have you heard about this new Star Citizen game that that's coming out? Check out my referral link to get a free in-game credit so I can add another ship to my hangar. You think I'm gonna spend real money on these ships after this video? I'm not kidding. I'm not going anywhere until you click that link in the description box. Oh man. Good video, man. That was interesting. Yeah. Um, dang, I don't know what to say. Let me see. Is anybody else? What are they? What are they thinking? Like, of how your content is centered around enlightening people to the initially difficult to see truths in the gaming world. Yeah, that is really good. Definitely, man. So, like, good to hear from you on this all hair video game YouTube's most trusted squeaky wheel. <laughs> Seriously, go. Some appreciate your observations and the evident tangible change you brought with them. Yeah. So this was really cool. Like, yeah, there's been a lot of good games that have come out of like early access, and it's like there have been some gems, but it's still like for the most part, you're still gonna get a lot of duds or whatever, uh, which sucks if. You know if you're stuck in that or whatever but i think it's still it's still good or whatever definitely but yeah good video definitely i like it uh yeah i want to see more all right that's about it see ya